Hi, and welcome to The Longest War. I'm Albert Lewitton reporting. We call it The Longest War because even though the latest war between Israel and Hamas began on October the 7th, this war has actually been going on for decades, if not centuries. And so we wanted to take a look at, at different aspects of this war and different stories. Um, one story, and we'll bring it up to you shortly, is with Dan Perry. And he is he was uh, in charge of the AP and a lot of the coverage of the AP in the Middle East throughout the years. We'll get to him in just a moment. But first, what I want to do is bring you some of the headlines as we record this program. It's day 181 of the war uh, against Hamas, the, the war that started when Hamas broke through the gates and the fences around Gaza. Um, and slaughtered and murdered 1,200 innocent babies, women, children, Holocaust survivors, and kidnapped more than 100 of them and brought them back into Gaza. Uh, that was led three weeks later by a, a very strong counteroffensive by Israel, in which now tens of thousands have been killed. Um, and we'll get to all of those stories in just a moment. But first, let me bring you some of the headlines. First, you should know that as we record this, President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu will have a phone call later today. I'm sure a fly in the wall will be interested to hear as to what happens on that call. The IDF at the same time has paused all leads of any military personnel uh, there. If you probably are familiar, the IDF has been cycling in and out troops throughout the throughout the Gaza campaign. And so what the IDF has done has paused all leads. And that's at the same time that there's been some ramped up pressure. Uh, there, there are some indications that there are uh, increased tensions along the Lebanese border, as well as tensions with Iran. Uh, speaking of Iran, you should know that a few days ago, if you have not been catching up on the press, there was a, an explosion that occurred in a building adjacent to the Iranian embassy in Damascus. It's been attributed to Israel. Israel hasn't formally said that they had anything to do with it, but in the, in the bombing that killed several members, high-ranking members of the Inter uh, the Iranian Re Revolutionary Guard. These are, uh, this is basically the, the highest level uh, of, the I of the Iranian guards who've been killed since the 2020 um, assassination of Soleima Soleimani, who was a high-ranking general, the number two general uh, in the Iranian force. Uh, this also comes at a time that ISIS, in a separate incident, ISIS was planning an attack on Jerusalem and, and has been foiled by the Shin Bet and by the IDF. Uh, you should also know that there is, continues to be uh, a ramped up pressure on trying to get an, a military campaign into Rafah. Rafah is the southernmost city in, uh, in Gaza. It's on the border with Egypt. There has been a pause for Ramadan, the respecting and honoring the, the holiday of Ramadan. Ramadan is about to end next week. And so there's concern that that once that holiday is over, uh, there will be an in, a larger scale incident uh, with the IDF in uh, full scale, uh, full scale invasion of Rafah to try to get some of the Hamas soldiers uh, eliminated and also get some of the Israeli hostages brought back to Israel. This also comes at a time that there's been an increased investigation on the deaths of seven workers for the from the World Central Kitchen. This is a humanitarian food agency that has uh, that is uh, run by Jose Andres, a very famous chef, uh, that's garnered a lot of headlines. And we'll get through all of that in just a moment. But first, I want to bring in our guest for the hour. His name is Dan Perry. Dan Perry led the Associated Press coverage of Israel and the Middle East all throughout the 2010s. If you go from Pakistan to North Africa, the Associated Press uh, coverage of that area, and that was led by Dan. Before that, he went. He was in charge of Europe, of Africa, and the Caribbean. Uh, he was also, at one point, the Foreign Press Association chief in, in Jerusalem. And this is basically uh, a group, an association of all the members of the media that are in, in Jerusalem covering the Middle East. He's now the author of a newsletter, a must-read newsletter for the day for, for uh, I read it almost every week. It's called Ask Questions Later. So I'm going to ask the questions now of Dan Perry. Dan Perry, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure, Albert. Thank you. Dan, so uh, talk, I'm always fascinated by people who drop everything in their life and they say, I'm going to go to the Middle East. W what got you to do that? Uh, AP paid me for it. Uh, but uh, that, <laughs> I want to be facile. Look, I, I mean, I have a, uh, I, I, I decided I wanted to be a journalist. You know, my background was in technology. Uh, and at one point, uh, my master's degree is from Columbia. People assumed it was from the journalism school that hands out the Pulitzer Prizes, but it was from the engineering school. Uh, and at some point in the middle of my PhD, I was also a, sort of a hobbyist journalist. And I realized that PhD in computer science is unbelievably vertical. You know everything about one tiny niche and you can share that with three people in the world. 
Uh, whereas journalism is broad. You got to know a little bit about everything and sounds a bit superficial, but it also is a different kind of uh, intellectual challenge and satisfaction. I decided I was the latter. And I uh, approached Associated Press, asked them for a job, and I knew some Romanian because my parents are from Romania. There had just been a revolution in Romania. They were setting up a bureau there in the post-communist era. They rolled the dice on me and sent me there. And that's what made me a foreign correspondent. Yeah, but why did you decide, like when they said to you, hey, we have an opening in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv, and you said, fine. I mean, well, other people would have said, wait, are you kidding me? I, I, no, I'm no, no. Look, so I, actually, <laughs> I didn't realize you could talk about me, but uh, but uh, but people always like to, so why not? Um, I was a beer chief in the Caribbean in late 2000. Now, that's that was a really great job, and it was not trivial news-wise, but it was also a lot of fun because we had operations on 25 islands that I had to visit once a year. Uh, but when they offered me at that point, bureau chief in Jerusalem, at the height of the peace talks, uh, when in AP's universe, they had not yet created a regional structure. So this is one of the top three bureaus in the world. I could not say no. So that's how I ended up here during the second intifada. But uh, but also beyond that, I, uh, I I have lifelong ties to Israel. I spent some years here as a, as, as a, as a kid. Uh, throughout my career, my life, I've been here on and off. So when I left AP... Uh, after uh, like seven, eight years in Cairo, uh, my family had been living in Israel th throughout because Cairo is not really that family friendly, unfortunately. Uh, I, I joined them in Israel and it's it's a natural fit for me. And it's putting aside the headlines. Uh, Tel Aviv is a great place to live and uh, and and we have obviously strong ties to it. So so it's actually not what was the most, I mean, you were the uh, chief of the Jerusalem Foreign Press Association. What is the largest, the biggest challenge? I don't think people understand how difficult it is to be a journalist in this region. Yeah, uh, look, depends what you do. So if you're covering a war and you're in Gaza during Israeli bombardment of Gaza, the biggest challenge is not being killed. Uh, and, and, and indeed, when you're in Gaza, uh, when it's not being bombed by Israel and just being ruled by Hamas, the biggest challenge is how to go about your journalistic um uh, work with integrity when you're living in a police state where the truth might get you killed. Uh, that's these are not that this is a it's not an easy circle to square, and it is really part and parcel of journalism anywhere there is a non democracy. So AP, for example, is very proud of having a bureau in North Korea. It's one of the few organizations, Western news organizations, that does. Uh, AP also has a bureau in Cuba and in other dictatorships, China actually, uh, makes it very difficult to report uh, everything that one might want to report. So one steps gingerly and tries to report the essence somehow while not getting oneself expelled in the case of China and killed in the case of Gaza, run by Hamas. These, there's no perfect answer. Uh, well, Dan, how does somebody do that? So if I'm if if I'm a budding journalist who wants to be a freelance journalist, I can't just get on a plane, arrive at Ben Gurion and say, hi, I'm going to now look. I mean, it, it doesn't work that way, right? Uh, you could. And, you know, these days, everyone, including my two daughters, are, uh, are publishers because Facebook makes everyone, every one of potentially of eight billion people on the planet into a publisher. All social media does. So in a way, you kind of could. But if you want to have impact uh, in in in, in the uh, uh, mainstream news industry, uh, it's well. First of all, it's an ever uh, smaller circle of people because the industry is financially distressed and much smaller than it used to be. So it's hard to get hired. Uh, secondly, there's a whole big complex of uh, uh, you know facilities you have to have and ethics you must maintain. Uh, and knowledge that ideally you should have of of, of the world, of, of 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 business, of politics, of the history of your region, of languages, of culture. It's not easy to do it well. And in the case uh, of the Israel-Palestinian conflict beyond uh, the difficulty of Gaza, which I was addressing before, uh, you have here a paradigm that doesn't always apply, that's actually fairly rare, where you have a longstanding struggle between two groups of people, and really since both groups are divided, it's among themselves, it's more than two. Uh, but let's just say Israelis and Palestinians, or Israelis and Arabs in a way, uh, where the narratives of each side, the dominant narratives on each side are so distinct that they sometimes seem to barely overlap. Uh, recent polls 
Recent polls have shown that 93% of Palestinians in the West Bank do not believe that Hamas committed the atrocities that it committed uh, on October 7th. Now, it's not a it's not that they don't think that, that such actions are atrocities. I thought that's not the issue. They don't believe it happened. They don't believe it happened, even though even though the perpetrators gleefully filmed themselves and put it up on the internet. Now, when when this happens, when this type of thing happens, the frustration for anyone trying to approach it um with with objectivity, forget neutrality, with just respect for the facts, is is huge. Huge. Israelis, meanwhile, they're they're a different kind of society. Uh, it's a democratic society that does sort of operate in the Euclidean universe that most uh, viewers of this podcast might. Sure, but 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 most Israelis don't really know what happens in their name. Forget about Gaza and the West Bank that is still properly occupied by Israel. Uh, they kind of don't want to know. It's too complicated. It's too ugly. It's um, too frustrating to deal with. It's too, it's too combustible uh, uh, intellectually and practically. <laughs> That's, they, they, they would rather look away. Um, and so really, you try to tell Israelis that what happens in the West Bank is really not okay. Uh, and it tends to be either a short discussion or an angry discussion, depending on what type of politics they have. Um, but it's different because you, I mean, you covered, you know, the area extremely well, the region well. I'm talking the larger region of Afghanistan. It's like trying to tell Americans what happened in Afghanistan, Kuwait, Iraq in the, after 2000, after 9-11. I, I mean, we, as Americans, we kind of had that distance. You don't need to tell us because it's so far away, but here you don't have that distance. It's 20 minutes by car. It's five minutes by light rail. It's a different, it's in your face. Uh, you mean in the case of Israel for Americans or Israelis? Yeah, no, no, it, it, within within Israel, in terms of like trying to tell the Israelis their story of what's happening within yeah. within. I tell you though, it may as well be you know in the hills of Afghanistan. Even though the West Bank is thirty miles from where I sit here in Tel Aviv, there's an enormous security barrier uh, uh, between here and there. And other than settlers, most of whom are on this side of the snaking security barrier that eats into the West Bank a little bit. Other than settlers deep inside the territory, most would never go there. Um, and, and most another, aren't allowed there, first of all. And they're not allowed, basically, uh, into the actual Palestinian islands of autonomy. It is so complex what goes on in the West Bank uh, that that's one problem. It's too complicated for people to deal with. They don't feel like, you know, uh, doing doctoral studies about it. And the other thing is, when you tell when you tell Israelis, look, the West Bank, what happens there in your name is not okay, the implication is there's a better way out. And in fact, that that's not so clear. I myself argue for a partition of the country and for Israel to find a way out and to disengage from the West Bank. That's true. That's my preferred outcome. But in reality, it may it's not a good option. It is at best the least bad option. Least bad option by definition is still bad because if Israel really pulls out of the West Bank, meaning it's, it will no longer have effective control over what happens 30 miles from here, and that territory will be taken over by jihadists, like somewhat more distant Gaza was, the result could be the same as what happened in Gaza, right? They use it as a base to attack uh, Israel, Israel this time from very close to its main cities. Now that Israel can't handle. That would be 10 times worse on October 7th for Israel. Potentially, because it's just so much more of a population. Imagine if Israel's response was then ten times worse upon the West Bank than what it's what it has been upon Gaza. It may be that Israel pulling out, which is the implication of people who, uh, by people who who argue against what happens today, it may be that good intentions will bring about an even bigger disaster. So the moral complexity, the practical complexity, the strategic complexity is just. It's too much for most people. Most people don't want to debate politics all day. They want to have a beer. They want to hang out with their family. They want to go ahead, get ahead in their career. They, they don't want never ending political discourse. That's even just for internal Israel. Imagine now, let's talk about the complexities of describing this as a journalist for outside audiences, for American audiences, for European audiences. Well, yeah. How do you even begin? I mean, I, I, you can't. I don't think it's I, I think it's impossible. So there's a number of things that, uh, that, that come into play here. Uh, 
one thing is that when you have such competing narratives and you're trying you're trying to present it in a way that is interesting it starts to look like what journalists call both sidesism you know joe says this jim says that you decide but no one but the average reader doesn't want to hear that they just want to hear in fact what's actually going on and and, and for journalists a situation like this presents a challenge if you just say what's going on you're going to look sometimes like you're taking sides like you're deciding between the competing narratives and taking sides is in theory uh, uh verboten uh for you know what the anglo-american school of journalism um so keeping the audience awake in a situation this confoundingly and frustratingly complex is one problem another uh is frankly uh the news business has uh, even bigger challenges in general, because under 35s are checking out of the news. Uh, more and more people, because of uh, political shenanigans in America, distrust the mainstream media. There's some notion that you can just go to social media and get your news there, which is nonsensical and nefarious on a whole in a whole variety of ways. Uh, keeping and and this, while the media has such financial pressures on it because the internet blew up the business model uh, and didn't replace it with a better one, um, that there's fewer and fewer reporters, right? And, and furthermore, the, these fewer and fewer reporters are working for platforms that are constantly competing with non-journalistic platforms for the same audience, which thinks it's getting the news, namely social media and, and, and its related tentacles. Uh, it is incredibly difficult to basically in this situation, deal with a fundamental challenge that faces journalists everywhere where journalism is a business, which is do you report what's interesting or do you report what's important? Now, that's not the same thing. If AP reported only what was interesting, what was most interesting to people, conceivably it would be down to sports and celebrities and salacious gossip. Honestly, if you look at the numbers, that's where that would lead. But if it did that, it would also destroy its brand equity and cease being distinctive and not serve, in fact, that bit of the audience that has the highest per capita relevance to advertisers, which is educated and informed and, and, and professionals. Uh, it's so complex to figure out how to be interesting, but also address what's important, right? And in a case like, like Israel, uh, you know, the 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 Israel-Palestine, the 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 cliche says if it bleeds, it leads. So yeah, sure, when there's a lot of bleeding, it's interesting. But in the interim periods between the wars, it's very difficult to keep people interested in something so complicated that's far away. It's funny, I was I'm gonna mention this. Uh, a good friend of mine, Don Lemon, has a show that he did an interview the other day with the ambassador the UN, the US ambassador to the UN, Linda Thomas Greenfield. And in that on that show. She mentioned Sudan, and she had to go to Sudan with three journalists to try to explain what was happening in Sudan, and she couldn't find any journalists to go with her. She had to, like, beg and grovel and got three of them to come with her to Sudan to mention a famine that's occurring, that's actually occurring right now. Not a, not a potential for a famine, but an actual famine, an actual genocide that's occurring. And on that show, what, he, what she told Don Lemon was that she cannot understand why the, the media have been unable to understand what is happening outside the world without focusing specifically on what's happening on Israel, Gaza. And I just wondered, as someone who has covered Africa, as someone who has covered the Middle East and the region, do you subscribe to what she told Don Lemon? It is hard to get Western audiences uh, to care about complex, distant wars in general. Now, sometimes this changes, uh, and factors apply even when something is at a great distance that causes them, yes, to be interesting. That happened for a time with Ukraine. It happens again and again with Israel. There are reasons in both cases. The default is they're not so interesting. Uh, when when I was when I was running Africa uh, for AP, that was a massive challenge because Africa people don't know how huge it is. Sudan, Sudan would cover the majority of the territory of the European Union. It's just enormous. Getting around is difficult because you don't have super highways. It's expensive. It's dangerous. Danger comes at you from everywhere, including the government, uh, including the rebels. <laughs> There's a high price to pay for covering uh, wars in Africa uh, properly. It's difficult. 
And the reward is is pretty meager because other than maybe a Pulitzer Prize, you're not going to get that many readers. And, you know, it used to be 30 years ago that we could only speculate. But these days, you know, the, the digital environment tells you exactly what percentage of the audience is clicking on, on, on the story and how far down in the story they go, how much time they spend. We, we know with exactitude that people tend to not be interested. So is a news organization really going to send someone into deepest Central Africa, right? Between Rwanda and, and Congo uh, that, that may well get those people killed, that will cost an enormous amount in insurance and in just logistical costs. Under these circumstances, they're not gonna. Meanwhile, Israel is 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 that rare case where it's a first world environment. It's easy to get to. There's none of the problems I just mentioned. Uh, there's every conceivable support technologically and, and 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 logistically, and and the distances are short. And yet, the quality of the story that you get in terms of the bleeding uh, is like a third world story in a first world environment. That's optimal for journalism because it's inexpensive in a way. And it, it does, and it is interesting. There's other reasons why Israel is interesting. Um, the Holy Land aspect is one of them. Uh, the fact that Israel sits at the confluence of all these different cultures. Uh, the fact that it's so emotive to uh, Muslims and Christians uh, to the point where among American evangelicals, you think it's a domestic story. Uh, yeah. And for Muslims all over the region, it actually is weirdly a domestic story. Uh, that means that you're getting a lot of clicks for relative, relatively little expense. So it seems like it's low hanging fruit. Yeah. Now, I said before, even under these circumstances, when there's no war going on, it's still difficult to keep audiences interested. And interested. But, but nonetheless, if you look at the various alternatives in the world with the report on, uh, Israel is one of the easier ones outside the matter we discussed, which is the competing narratives make the story frustratingly complex. But in terms of getting there, the ease and, and, of, and practicality of that, if you decide you want to go, it's incomparably more uh, plausible than, than going to Sudan or Central Africa. Right. Or going, for instance, a great story that sadly underreported story is in Nigeria, where hundreds of school children were held hostage for days, uh, weeks underreported, maybe a scant mention on an AP wire that somebody maybe saw, and it got very ho-hum coverage anywhere. You know, there's there's an element of what some people would call racism here. We're talking about Western audiences. Now, of course, the U.S. is decreasingly white, obviously, and it will soon be majority minority. Um, but for the purpose of this discussion, the West is largely white. Look, there, this... The, the, the data shows uh, audiences in these countries are more shocked by death and destruction in a place that is perceived as close to them culturally. Nigeria is not. Israel is. Uh, Ukraine sort of is. Now, Ukraine for a while was, you know, dark side of the moon because of the Soviet Union uh, uh, history. But in the past 30 years, especially given the prominence of Ukrainian Americans in some parts of the country, uh, it's, it's, it's almost a domestic story, and it seems like they're one of us. Uh, and therefore, there's a lot of interest in it uh, initially. But, you know, even in Ukraine, it's not as difficult to get to, uh, or even now as dangerous as parts of Africa. But the fact is, very few journalists got beyond the Ukrainian-Russian front, front line. There's almost no one on the Russian side. Uh, and, and to be there is very dangerous unless you're parroting uh, the Russian talking points. And so that conflict... And where are the protests there, Dan? Where are the protests from the European and American media of access into Russia there? Well, the thing is, Russia Russia is seen as the bad faith player in that conflict, and the U.S. is not seen as supporting Russia, so there's no context for the protests. The context for the protests is when... The U.S. or the West is seen as supporting the bad faith player. And that enters something else, which is a competing narrative. Is Israel, who's getting the support, which is causing the protests and the anger of Biden, the bad faith player here? Uh, one narrative would say that this is completely absurd. A different narrative would argue that, in fact, Israel is. Now, to understand which one is right and are there shades of gray, then we have to delve into what's going on on the ground. But one thing that is undeniable 
is that the current round of warfare was started by Hamas, uh, which launched an invasion on October 7th that was unprovoked, in the context of which they murdered over uh, 1,200 people and the kind of massacre that has not been visited upon a Western country since World War II. That's what started it. And Hamas could also stop it instantly if they gave up the hostages they hold and laid down their arms. And I think Israel would also let their leadership go into exile scot-free. In fact, they continue to hold their population, not just as human shields, but as a human fortification in a way that has never, ever been done. And in, in, in my experience, other than perhaps Islamic State and Muslim, but I think even then you could kind of escape Muslim if you're a civilian, mostly. You cannot escape Gaza. And yeah, I think this has been underreported by the media. Uh, I think I have a bit of mea culpa. I think, I think the because I do I do associate with the international media. I think that's the reporting has therefore been a disservice to audiences. Let's uh, let's talk. You've mentioned on the ground, so uh, there were eight workers for the the world kitchen world. Uh, kitchen that were uh, killed by an Israeli airstrike. There have been in Ukraine many aid workers who have been killed by Russian airstrikes. There have been uh, many aid workers in Africa that have been killed by, by name, the, name the conflict, name the bad actor, the good actor. They've been killed in action. It is a war zone. And I don't know whether or not, and you tell me, why has this gotten so much coverage? Is it because there's a celebrity involved or is it because it's where it is or are there a lot of competing factors in there? No, because it slots into one of the narratives in a way that is very strong. It, it, there's a debate of whether Israel's the good guy or the bad guy in this conflict. If you go, if you go around killing you know, aid workers, uh, even if um, not on purpose, uh, but because you weren't careful enough, that argues for the bad guy nerd. Uh, it, so it, it helps a certain side of the argument. Uh, look, and also killing of aid workers is never going to be popular, right? But when Russia does it, there's nothing counterintuitive about it. When Israel does it, and they're supposed to be, in the eyes of, I think, 75 or 80% of Americans, the, the side that is the more moral one, the side that is in the right somehow, uh, then that is, that is man bites dog. Right when Russia kills aid workers, when horrible dictatorships kill aid workers, where there's no dis disputing that they are, and there's no narrative conflict whether they are or not, then that is that is dog bites man. And by definition, uh, counterintuitive is more interesting because it's surprising. Uh, look, also there's a practical issue here, which is Israel says it didn't mean to. This doesn't happen every day that you kill aid workers without meaning to. Okay. Uh, it kind of suggests a light trigger finger and that we're not being so careful. Uh, and, and that slots into a very big question, here, which is, if we are to believe the numbers of over 30,000 people killed in Gaza, and by the way, I don't believe the Hamas numbers, there's no reason to believe them, except that Israel doesn't dispute them so much, so it's probably largely true. If so many people have been killed, was it, uh, was it uh, unavoidable? Was it as uh, as some like John Spencer famously argues all the time? Nonetheless, in the context of a ratio of combatants and non-combatants that is actually not uh, that unusual and even quite good, uh, or is Israel being careless or even deliberately careless in order to uh, uh, get the Palestinians to overthrow Hamas or whatever? In other words, there's a question here: Is Israel doing enough, doing all it can, going even beyond the, the call of duty? Uh, to to avoid civilian casualties, or on the other hand, is Israel in fact careless and uh, and 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 light fingered on the trigger? This outcome with the aid workers that were killed supports the latter theory, uh, and and because of that, it is very embarrassing for Israel, causes reputational damage, and doesn't help their case as they're trying to maintain international legitimacy to uh, finish the war by going into Rafah, the last redoubt of uh, the Hamas leadership, as you were uh, uh, discussing in your headlines. 
You know, Dan, I, this also puts Netanyahu in a very, I guess, between a rock and a hard place. I mean, it seems as though here he's having a phone call today with the president of the United States. And the president of the United States, I'm sure, is going to give a scolding. I don't know the right word to describe it. And a scolding an American president can give. Uh, this also puts him in a situation where he, he can't, the, I'm talking about Netanyahu, you can't turn to the left without getting yelled at by somebody. It can't turn to the right without getting yelled at by someone. So in some ways... Uh, I would imagine the prime minister is basically going to say, listen, I'm just going to do this on my own, and I don't care what anyone says. Well, that's how he's operated throughout his career. Um, look, Netanyahu's, I, I'm not telepathic, but I have, I, I've I've actually met, I've met with him numerous times, our first conversation. What's he like? Just curious, curious. I'm just curious. What's he like? He's incredibly smart. Uh, in terms of IQ, uh, and he's quite robotic in terms of EQ. Uh, he doesn't listen. His arrogance is overpowering. His disdain for people who disagree with him is genuinely off-putting. Uh, but his ability to make lemonade out of lemons, to, to op optimize, not to maximize, the utility of whatever arguments he might have uh, to, 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 uh, to bring to bear, is truly astounding. He has a sort of brilliance about it. But unfortunately, he has used that brilliance uh, in the service of policies that I think are not just detrimental to Israel, but, but potentially fatal. And I'm talking about the internal dispute with the um, uh, ultra-Orthodox sector, and that's an internal Israeli issue that is potentially fatal. Uh, and with the Palestinians, he's failed to comprehend that Israel needs partition from the Palestinians to survive. It's not a favor you're doing to the Palestinians. If Israel doesn't detach from West Bank and Gaza, Israel will die. And Netanyahu has done everything conceivable in his 30 years as a leading Israeli politician to prevent that partition. Uh, so he's brought his rhetorical and intellectual skills uh, 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 to a place that is bad for Israel. I'll give you another example. Netanyahu dared go off to Congress and argue against Barack Obama's policy in 2015 on the Iran nuclear issue. He wanted the U.S. to not sign a nu nuclear deal uh, with Iran. Now, most of Israel's security establishment opposed that point of view. Uh, he obviously failed with Obama, thus making enemies out of much of the Republic of Democratic Party and beginning a process where Israel is now a partisan issue. That was the cost. What was the benefit? Well, B Obama signed a deal anyway, which was good for Israel. And then when Netanyahu, when Trump got elected, Netanyahu convinced him to pull out of the deal, which is bad for Israel, right? Why did they pull out of the deal? Because Netanyahu said correctly that Iran still does terrorism, so that's bad, and Iran still builds missiles, and that's bad. But Iran was uh, no longer building a nuclear weapon. Once the U.S. pulled out of the deal, Iran didn't stop terrorism, it didn't stop building rockets, and it did restart its nuclear program, where no one disagrees now that Iran is a threshold nuclear state, which is a danger to the world. A danger to the world brought to you by Netanyahu and Trump. Now, Trump is clueless, so I'm not surprised. But Netanyahu is brilliant. So I don't know what the bug is in that system, but, but that's the reality. And Netanyahu, to your question, will survive as long as the 63 lemmings that back him in the Israeli parliament of 120 uh, don't don't show some spine. Uh, I don't think a lot of people understand that the protests that are occurring in Israel, even to this day. I mean, people think like, oh, they're protesting. They're protesting him. I don't necessarily. Can you explain for the audience what these protests are about? And, and, and I know it's very difficult. It's a complex situation. I've been there to these protests and see them as an observer. And I, having lived there for a while, don't understand why all the complexities. So can you explain to the audience what, what are all these protests? Well, about half the country hates all of his policies. On top of that, the half that hates all his policies feel uh, empowered by the weird veneer of corruption that has attached Netanyahu. The guy is insisting on clinging to power while he's on trial for bribery, fraud, and breach of trust. Uh, this has never happened. No one ever thought it could happen. It's not against the law, but it was simply not done. 
But in the era of Donald Trump, there's no such thing anymore as not done. If it's possible, then it could be done. He's clinging to power in a way that seems illegitimate to half the country. Now, on top of that, he lost the support of maybe close to half of the side that used to support him because of the epic failure of October 7th. That was a breakdown of intelligence, a breakdown of tactics on the ground, a complete uh, uh, invalidation of Netanyahu's idea that Hamas should be kept in power in Gaza because that weakens the Palestinians by sp splitting them internally. This complex thought that he had that basically came down to it's good that Hamas is in power. This has made it so three quarters of people want him gone. Now, in the U.S. presidential system, if a president is outrageous and everyone hates him or her, there's nothing that can be done under the U.S. system short of a conviction in the Senate following an impeachment, which is not so likely. Which, so, right. so, which was tried twice in America. Yeah. So uh, there's no frustration when protests lead to nothing. But in parliamentary systems, when a government has failed cataclysmically, and when polls show that three quarters of the people want it gone, and that if an election were held, it would clearly lose, which is all the case in Israel, there is an expectation that they should sort of get that and call a new election. That's how the parliamentary system works. But it's not in law. By law, Netanyahu can hang out on until 2026, if he maintains his majority support in parliament. So there is enormous pressure on his coalition to find five rebels to join the opposition and bring it down to government. And the pressure on them is on them is overwhelming. Now, are there five people left in the Tenaus Likud, let's say, which is a center-right party, not the extreme right or the, or the religious fringe, that have that kind of moral and, and and ethical and composure and even intellectual wherewithal to understand? Possibly not. Netanyahu, as part of his strategy, has expunged from the party any potential Mitt Romney, John McCain types who might, you know, who might be independent. All those, are, they're gone. Uh, and uh, I mean, his coalition really is a bunch of lemmings. So it's conceivable, conceivable, that uh, he'll hang on. You know, the current situation is, and I wrote this somewhere, you could have the power grid going down, you could have the Russians invading, you could have a plague of locust looming, and nothing can be done unless five of the lemmings understand how 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 much it's the patriotic act to bring down this government. I know, but Dan, you have that 25% of Israelis who believe, believe in him, right? You mentioned 75% that don't. And that's the majority. That's correct. But no, not even. Percent that not, do. Not, even. not even. Because th this gets into inside baseball for your viewers, but 15% are the are the uh, uh, Haredi ultra-Orthodox Jews who are not Netanyahu supporters by any stretch of imagination. They just want the extreme right in power because, because they, they hold the key to that coalition and get money for their seminaries and, and, and respect for their traditions and and, and all the rest of us, that's just automatic, right? If you take that out of the equation, 90% of the remainder want it to nail gone. It's, it's really quite striking. But then you have that, so let's talk about a little bit of, uh, I mean, I, I could sit for another hour, which I don't think we have time for another hour, but let's talk about, the, let's talk about that because there is, a, there is a part of the Israeli belief that, uh, to borrow the French expression, après moi le déluge, the after me the deluge, right? You, you're going to get rid of me? Who's going to be, who's going to take care of this mess if I'm gone? His wife has practically said that. I mean, his wife is a whole different story. Fascinating something, yeah. Yeah, oh my lord. Uh, Lady Macbeth is nothing compared to Sarah Netanyahu. But, uh, as she basically said, more or less après moi le déluge, in different words in Hebrew. Uh, I don't think they actively are that unpatriotic, but their actions certainly suggest uh, 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 some sort of Louis the Fourteenth complex. The, the other uh, l'état c'est moi, the state is me. That that he has that for sure. Look, power corrupts and absolute power. Netanyahu does not have absolute power that would corrupt. Absolutely, but he he, he kind of acts like he thinks he does. 
Uh, right, but who's the, who's so who's who would take over? Naftali Bennett, who uh, Yair Lapid? There's like a number of them who might, but I don't think they want the job. Oh, they want the job. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, no, it's not. No, there's there's no shortage of people who want the job, and I would say of the. 10 million Israelis, probably 9 million, 999 would do less than. I'm exaggerating slightly, but um, but but not by that much, Franklin. I gotta say. I mean, Netanyahu right now, uh, look, he's why is he at loggerheads with Biden, more or less? Because he refuses to say yes to a deal that would restore the Palestinian Authority to Gaza, something Israel's been requesting ever since 2007 when Hamas overthrew the PA and in return received peace with Saudi Arabia. Now, I'm not saying if Israel said yes to that deal, Hamas would lay down its arms, but the pressure would be enormous and Israel would regain the moral high ground and international legitimacy for whatever is to come if the war had to continue. The fact that he's saying no to the deal that Biden pulled together, uh, and the, thus refusing to put, put the pressure on Hamas is not just endangering the hostages. That is looking at a table with, with like a ton of money on it and saying, I'm going to leave that money on a table because, because I know that if I took that money for Israel, for the Palestinians, for the region and for the world, their benefit, well, my coalition might collapse because the extreme right might bring me down, which indeed is true. But then he'd go out after a record time in office for any Israeli prime minister with his dignity intact and with uh, the good of Israel provably in his heart. He's not doing this. Now, you can draw your own conclusion. Biden sees this, overlays on top of that his own political interest in the U.S. to have this war go away, because the U.S., uh, be, be, because uh, war is a wedge issue that uh, divides his brittle democratic coalition, and no matter where he goes, he loses either the Muslims and the progressives or the Jews and the centrists. He needs the war done. <laughs> Netanyahu is preventing that, um, or at least preventing hope of that. Again, even if Bibi agreed, Hamas may still take action with prolonged war. But he he looks like he is, uh, uh, you know, being manipulated by Netanyahu, and that's not helping him in the election. So that's why Biden's upset. And remember, Netanyahu is courting this schism with uh, with the with the U.S. administration at a time when that administration, even though some might say that it's not sufficiently helped Israel, nonetheless, is the biggest protector of Israel on the planet. Without U.S. military assistance, mainly spare parts and, and munitions, uh, and without U.S. umbrella at the Security Council, Israel will be facing global economic, economic sanctions tomorrow. Uh, but, at so the same, but Dan, at the same time, it, it's if, if I can interrupt you and, and, a, and a strategic failure that is genuinely bedazzling. But is it bedazzling or is it a, 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 a almost super intelligent? You mentioned the fact that that Netanyahu is brilliant in terms of intelligence, right? Whether EQ is not there at all, his IQ might be superior. So is he running the clock? Is he saying, listen, you know what? I'm going to run the clock out another seven months. Trump will be in office. I'm ba banking on that. Let them fight amongst themselves in the United States. It's totally fine. I see it. I, I'm looking at the tea leaves. The tea leaves say Trump is going to win, and if that's the case, I'm fine. Uh, without a doubt, that is part of the equation. I'm not saying it's all of it, because, of course, Trump is unpredictable, and who knows what he'll do if he gets elected. Uh, uh, he was last heard from on the issue of Netanyahu, uh, uh, you know, cursing him out in public because he dared call Biden to congratulate him, uh, saying he'd never work with him again. So that's not, it's, it's not a sure thing, Trump helping Israel more. But, but yeah, that's part of the equation. And remember, Netanyahu's modus operandi is, 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 is to run at the clock, or, or more correctly, to just buy time all the time. To, to divide and conquer, to create chaos and confusion, to, to present himself as the person at the center who can keep the center holding, and always buy time. Never really do anything, but buy time. Because of... The scenario where he seems to genuinely believe that this is his type of patriotism. I think he believes that the good of Israel demands he be in power no matter what. So even if a short-term good, like accepting the Biden proposal, seems like it's good in the long term, if he's out of power, 
that's to the ultimate detriment of Israel. So there you go, a version of patriotism. I, I want to focus back a little bit, back to where we started about journalism. And I want to talk about the fact that, that there was a law passed by the Knesset recently that, that basically shut down Al Jazeera. Uh, and what your thoughts about that Knesset law is and whether or not that bodes, what that bodes for other foreign media that may want to, that uh, not Al Jazeera, but maybe one day it's a, it's a Western media, it's one day an American media that runs afoul of the government. Well, absolutely. My my reading of it is it is a, a, a boneheaded in the way that is typical of populist uh, far right governments. It sounds good to some people in their base, but upon reflection, is all pain, no gain. Uh, the law in question, indeed, would allow the what could easily be abused to shut down AP and CNN based on a national security argument. They reported something that endangered national security. You can always argue that. Um, now they'd have to bring it before a judge, by the way. Um, uh, but they're trying and to, it's 45 days. It's also, it's a short term. Yeah. It's, it's temporary, be but, but temporary laws, they're designed to be easily made permanent. It's clearly designed just to, to shut down Al Jazeera and not AP or CNN. Uh, uh, but you can't pass a law to shut. I mean, it looks, it's just too ridiculous to pass an Al Jazeera law. So it's general. Uh, that said, what will it solve? Al Jazeera can... Uh, still operates uh, in the Palestinian areas. Al Jazeera can still use agency stuff from Israel. Al Jazeera uh, could still interview people in Israel uh, uh, by by video conferences we're doing today. Al Jazeera can still have their debates in the studio where they uh, say stuff that is unappealing to the Netanyahu government. It won't change anything at all. But it will give tremendous ammunition to people who want to show that Israel's moving in the direction of Putin's Russia, right? It'll undermine Israel's credibility as a liberal democracy. It will plummet in the Transparency International and Democracy Indexes, and that will very like that will attach to troubles with the credit agencies and in, with uh, global investors and international markets, and it will just continue the downward slide of Israel for absolutely no gain at all, nothing. Isn't there a gain, though, some sort of gain? There's a gain in the sense that, like, listen, I, it, what they're reporting half of the time is true, not true. We don't really know. No one seems to know. Uh, no one really knows. On. I mean, it's, you have to be, I'm not saying this of you, of course. <laughs> you have to be unusually naive to think that's the issue. The people who think Al Jazeera is biased against Israel uh, wouldn't mind if anyone was biased in favor of Israel. And plenty of Palestinians would tell you that the foreign media, at least before the progressive revolution of recent years, but historically, has been biased in favor of Israel. That's what Palestinians will tell you. They don't mind that. It's not a, these are not journalistic purists who feel that Al Jazeera, you know, is, is in a dereliction of duties journalists. It's nationalism happening. Um, look, it's true that Al Jazeera, uh, their basic perspective is not friendly, not just to the Netanyahu government, but 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 to Israel's overall policies in West Bank. They clearly think a genocide is happening in Gaza. It is not by the definition of genocide. They clearly uh, refrain from uh, from uh, criticizing Hamas very much, whereas I think Hamas is an enemy of the Palestinian people, of Arabs in general, of Muslims, and of humanity. Is a part of the global jihadi movement that would not be good for business in Miami, uh, and 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 so on. So, yeah, they're not my cup of tea. But on the other hand, on the other hand, you know what? Al Jazeera, full disclosure, they've had me on half a dozen times. Uh, I am not there as a spokesman for anyone, but they know that my perspective uh, is not the one that is not closely aligned with their own. Uh, I have argued my point on a genocide issue, on whether the West Bank occupation is illegal. I think it is not illegal, but I do think it's unwise. And wrong, but not illegal. Uh, and they let me speak. The interviews can be feisty and combative, but they let me speak. Uh, they invite me back. They're not the two-headed monster, quite that uh, you know that the other side's propagandists would have you believe. You know what? Channel fourteen in Israel, uh, which is the equivalent of Fox, would not have me on. <laughs> Al Jazeera does. And and it's not because I agree with Al Jazeera. It's because they're 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 more even-handed as journalists, which is not saying a lot. 
but it's something. But it also speaks, I guess, that the, the fact let's let's talk about the, uh, the fact that Israel has a really bad PR situation going on. I mean, even even one of their chief international spokespersons was, was recently let go and he had to start his own his own brand of of, of spokespersoning, which I didn't even think was a word. But I guess it is no, that was part and parcel of the incredible inanity of this government. He did great work bringing Israel's point across. Fantastic. No doubt about it. He was let go because, and this has been reported, I don't, don't know personally, but it's been credibly reported, that Sarah Netanyahu decided he was really the wrong person because he was involved in demonstrations against her husband during the Putinization effort of, uh, of, of last year. So basically, it's not on their political side. But that's irrelevant now. And he was doing great work for Israel. They don't care. That's why he was let go. That tells you that kind of chicanery explains why Israel's PR is so bad. Now, look, I think, honestly, it's more than PR. It's a question of public diplomacy. I mean, why is the government not out there every day saying this war can end right now on very reasonable terms if Hamas just did X, Y, Z? I'm not saying Hamas would do X or Y or Z, but I'm saying that kind of clear public diplomacy would put Israel in a different place and possibly gain it international legitimacy to continue the war until the end, which a lot of people, including me, think would be a good thing if Hamas were completely eradicated in Gaza. Because, they're because again, Netanyahu knows that if he did that, sounding reasonable, he'd have trouble with the far right that would bring down his government. So PR can't put lipstick on a pig. It can try. But if the public diplomacy is so bad, then you're not going to do well. Now, there's a bigger picture, too which is maybe the PR wasn't so bad historically because Israel's policy towards the Palestinians in the West Bank is one of the few things that can unite the global community from Korea to California in thinking that it's bad and that it's bad in ways that are important. The world hates Israel's policy vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. Even Israel's friends, half of them, hate it Israel's population, half of it, hates it. And despite this incredible situation that has few equivalents on the planet, Israel is a major trading partner. The major uh, the EU is Israel's major trading partner. It is a close ally of the U.S. It has an automatic veto for inconvenient resolutions by the U.S. at Security Council. It is a major trading partner of China and India. Uh, it has peace with most of the important Arab countries. It has a higher per capita GDP than Britain, Germany, or France. It doesn't look right now like it's paying the price for the bad PR. Maybe the PR isn't that bad. But we'll see. Right now, the dynamic is not good. One last topic I wanted to hit on with you before we go is that the the I don't even really know what to, the controversy surrounding the photo of Shani Luke, who is one of the hostages being brought, who is... Uh, taken on October the 7th by Hamas terrorists on a pickup truck. The photo uh, was seen around the world and just recently won an award um, for the best photo of the year. Um, that's something that journalists have not been, uh, I'm going to make it very clear. A lot of the people I've, I've gotten yelled at by uh, many members of the public saying, how, how dare journalists laud that? How dare they allow uh, a freelance journalist who probably was a terrorist sympathizer, this is their quotes, was not only a terrorist sympathizer, potentially someone who actually took part in this, be given an award. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on this, considering that you were, uh, frankly, you were paid by AP at some point in your life. Uh, what are your thoughts of this? Um, this, is, uh, this is an impossible issue. The question of whether when news is gruesome, and its dissemination can be disrespectful to the object of the picture, the subject of the picture, uh, or of the story. What's more important, maintaining the dignity of the, the victim in such cases, or letting people know? Uh, there, there's no right answer. Uh, I think organizations need to just be consistent in how they decide to, to, to sort of deal with this ethical issue. That the photo is interesting is, is not debatable. That the photo is important in showing what happened is also not debatable. 
that the photo is excruciating to the family of Shani Lok is also true. Um, in the past, most Western news media would therefore not have published the photo. I mean, we did not publish really gruesome pictures, or we published them uh, with a warning to media that it may be offensive to the audience. It's a little bit subjective which one you do, but but there's no debating. This goes back. I mean, this is journalism 101. This is back from the from the time of Vietnam, where the where the yeah, young girl, girl, yeah, Napalm sure. girl, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so in this was case, it respectful guess, to Napalm girl? No, it was not. Plus, she was fully naked, no, uh, not dead, but but boy, was that not respectful? Is that photo not iconic of the Vietnam War? Did that photo not? Uh, help hasten the end of the Vietnam War? W was it good that it ended? I think the consensus now is yes, it was a hopeless war. Um, so again, some things are clear. This is very murky, what should have been done. I think I would not have published it, frankly. Um, the images of that girl are, it, it is so horrible. I could not live with myself for having done that to the parents, frankly. Now, AP did in many cases, that photo is published with a body blurred. I would have considered publishing it with a body blurred and with no name, just saying with a victim. The problem there was not that the photographer was in Israel illegally with the invasion force. It's not about, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, immigration policy in Israel. That's just the, not. No, no, but it has to do with the fact that the it, photographer was probably tipped off that something big was happening. Come join us. We're going to go. This and... is a complicated issue, man. It, it, it's, you know, there were several waves of people going in. Now, the way journalistic uh, enterprises work, once the fence has been breached and there's a huge thing happening on, on the other side, other people are going to go. Journalists will face pressure to go. These are freelancers, so they're going to try to sell a photo you know they're going to go and not worry about whether they're in Israel or the visa. Uh, the, the problematic aspect of the photo was not the presumed support of the photographer for the invasion force, but the horrible nature of showing the, the body of the, of the victim. And, and that could have been dealt with uh, by a more sensitive photo editors and in general by consistency with the policies of most Western media. Um, why it, the photo ever existed showing the body clearly the way it did, should that have won a prize? I really cannot say. All I can say is based on AP's policies that I myself would enforce from other war zones in the past, I would not have done it this way. Um, should it have won a prize? I mean, it's one university's contest. Once something can happen, then it will happen in one place or another. Will it win a Pulitzer Prize? I have my doubts, but then again, nothing would surprise me. Uh, a final question to you, Dan Perry, before we go. What is, in the six months, we've now hit six months, what is the number one most surprising thing that you've learned out of all of this? The degree of cluelessness on the part of Hamas supporters in the West. I, I... I always knew that maybe 10% of the youth in the West that are not even Muslim and not jihadi, because if you're jihadi, it's no surprise, of the, the regular non-jihadi Westerners. I knew a certain percent would be duped. But when polls show that half of Gen Z somehow supports Hamas, uh, Half of Gen Z with their ideas about, about gender and about identity, about fluidity, about who would be hung from the rafters in Gaza. They actually speak in favor of this jihadism. The degree to which that is prevalent, the bone crushing cluelessness that that manifests, reflects, the degree of it surprised me. And it clearly attaches to, the, to, to Gen Z's indifference to democracy, to liberalism, to Western uh, civilization, which is almost a bad word right now, uh, to the very things that enable them to have the freedom to be so daft, uh, that's very unfortunate. And the problem is bigger than what they think about Israel or Hamas. This is the, the, the support for Hamas is a vanguard 
for a much bigger war uh, that that is going to have to be prosecuted in the West, and and it's depressing. Dan Perry, your newsletter, Ask Questions Later, is a must-read. I just want to let our viewers thank know you, that. Man. So thank you so much for joining us today. Dan Perry, who for many years during the 2010s led AP's coverage of Israel and the Middle East uh, and was at one point the Farm Press Association uh, chair in Jerusalem. Again, Ask Questions Later is an amazing newsletter to read every day. Thanks again for joining us. And thank you, you viewers, for watching us here on Two Way. You can get more on The Longest War here on Two Way and on YouTube and anywhere else that you get uh, your podcast. Thanks again for joining us. I'm Albert Lewigen reporting. Thanks again. Have a good day.